very much for coming. Uh, Joe, thanks for joining us. Um, well done on finding the place. <laughs> I was the last on my bike for a solid 10 minutes. Um, so thanks for getting here. And Joe, thanks, congratulations. And thanks for writing this book. And Richard as well. Uh, well done. It's, um, I, I guess I was 20 pages in. And I thought, I must check back and see who this Joe Kerrigan is. And I went to the biog and I realized you'd had a, a long academic career. And it kind of made sense from reading, having read the first few uh, stories that, particularly it begins in you know very distant past, biblical times almost. And there's a lot in that that is maybe hearsay or myth or legend and you're very good at going into kind of pointing out well yes this is legend or this is the source material but this is perhaps a real life scenario on which it might have been based and um, so you did while the the stories i mean there's so many stories packed in here and um, and there's a lot of learning that's gone into it but you wear that learning very lightly and each of the stories I feel are, are just long enough, not too, not too long, not too short. <laughs> so you've nice. really done a great job on it. Um, but maybe you would just talk about, I mean, talk about your own background. I know that you, the, the, the bio says that your interest is in exploring how everyday life was lived long ago. Can you tell me a bit about how you got into that? I um, can. What led you to this book? I'd really? love to because yeah. What I, drives me mad is that when I get history and books, mostly the ones on Ireland, they, they're always talking about the people at the top. Mm -hmm. They're talking about the kings who were making fights and the politicians who were fighting and having battles and they say that this lord took over that land and this one invaded and he took over that place and then they all settled this and they made it a, a special marriage there. I thought, how about the everyday people? Where do they get their milk? Where do they get their bread? Mm -hmm. How do they live? What was their existence? How do they make their clothes? And, oh, I used to go tearing around to different universities where I were and say, I want to know how the everyday people lived. And they'd say, oh, you're one of those, are you? <laughs> now, we're doing a book on Michael Collins or we're doing a book on the old kings of Ireland. So I say, no, I want to know real people. Because that's how, that's how you see things. I mean, if you look outside here where we are today, there ancient, it's old Ireland and old industrial Ireland, people who made their living here, and the Grand Canal over there, which is now setting off across Ireland, and before that, the people who came and made their homes on this bit of Ireland. I've always wanted to see how real people lived, and the further back you go, the harder it is, because there are fewer records. But then you start looking at the old legends, and the old, so you said, oh, they're just legends. <laughs> <laughs> There is something at the bottom of every legend. Mm -hmm. You may hear a story. You may hear that the Devil's Bit Mountain is where the devil bit a piece out and threw it down to the ground, and it made the Rock of Cashel. Okay, well, he probably didn't actually come along and write it, but the Rock of Cashel is there, and it is a glacial erratic that came down from the mountains. You may hear a story about people who came to Ireland and who were ancient monsters or somewhere like that and you'd say well they probably weren't really monsters but there's a story behind it there's something behind everything that you read and everything you see and if there's a legend that says we had a flood or we had a great snowstorm in which everyone died there's always something underneath it and there's a story behind it and it's what you call folk memory that brings you back so so far mm -hmm. and you say okay there's something behind that i always quote the one of the it was an old english poem called beowulf and there's a great description in Beowulf of a magnificent helmet that the hero wore, which had a boar's head on top of it. It was made of gold, it had a boar's head. And everyone said, well, that's very nice, that's a legend, very sweet. And then they went and dug up a Viking burial, Sutton Who, I think, one of those. And they discovered, what do you know? They discovered the exact same helmet. So it was true. And it's, there are several places in this book where I heard a legend that this had happened, that one crowd had beaten another crowd on a sand where the sands had drifted away. And I thought, that doesn't sound right. Maybe it is so. And he went out geographically when the lockdown allowed us, and you found out that it was a fact. It was there, and you can see why it happened there, because it was the right place for it. Don't ever accept, don't ever accept the, the top story. Go down yeah. underneath it, Big and then underneath it again, and say, but why? Even if you're going out in the countryside and you see a road that suddenly turns right for no reason and then left again, you say, now why did it do that? Did some lord of the manor refuse to let it through? 
However, I'm getting off the and topic. Well, the, the first of the stories kind of has a good example of that. Maybe it introduces to Noah's granddaughter. Oh, Noah's granddaughter. Yeah. That's marvellous, yes. There's an old book, the Book of uh, Invasions of Ireland. It's a collection of legends from ancient times, which tells you about the uh, people who came to Ireland. We don't actually know the first were. I don't think there were people here in the Ice Age because no one could live in it. But after the Ice Age, the first people who are said to have come were Césaire and her people. And the big thing about Césaire and her people is that she was a woman. Now, that's not usual in history. As you know, it's almost always men. But this was Césaire. She came with her women, her great cohort of women with her, from the far southeast, southwest. Asia, anyway. Mm -hmm. She came from far south because, according to the legend, which was written, remember, by Christian monks, because they always made sure things reflected the Christian image, they, she came because of the flood. Because Noah, it said, said to her, the flood is coming, you will not be able to live here. Take your boat and with your women with you and go as far as you can to the west and maybe you will escape the flood. Gave me a shiver that when I read it because it sounded true. They knew down in the is Asia, where it was, well, on the coast of Turkey and the Black Sea, the flood was a genuine happening. It did happen. Now, it's in the Bible as the deluge and the flood and the Christians put there when it was God making a punishment and only the righteous were saved. But behind that is folk memory. There was, at some point, a great flood in probably in the Middle East of the world, and people tried to escape from it. And all the stories that you hear of the various ones of people surviving it, well, he, she was told to come away from it and to come to Ireland, to come to the far west. We were on the edge. Ireland was on the edge of the known world. We were on the very edge, the last place. And people have known about Ireland for millennia. They've mm -hmm. always known it was there and that it was green and that it was fertile and it was on the edge of the world. And she came here. And I, I can't help wondering what the deluge and the flood really were. And you, you allude to that, maybe a pos one possibility is the overflow from the Mediterranean the first yeah. time it breaks oh God, yes. into the Black Sea. Wasn't that wonderful? Yeah. It was, I saw it on television a few years back when we were preparing this book, and it was Ballard, I think is his name, as well, who does a lot of diving to old wrecks and to old shorelines, and he did some diving in the Black Sea. When it became possible, that bit of the Black Sea is kind of edgy between places like the Ukraine and coming along mm -hmm. and towards Turkey. He couldn't, but he got permission to dive to go down to dive. And what did he discover? Several miles down, several, sorry, fathoms, whatever down, there was an old shoreline. And below that again, way down below that again, the wrecks of old ships far down, deeper than you could go mm -hmm. on skin diving. You had to have special things to go down for there. But there actually was a much lower, there was much more land round about the Bulgaria coast, I would say, Romania, Bulgaria. And there was an old shoreline and the remains of ancient houses. Now, that shows that the flood happened there. And what they think happened, his idea was, and I didn't kind of agree with him, was that it was a tsunami, that the water broke through from Mediterranean. It could even be one of the eruptions on one mm -hmm. of the islands, on the Greek islands, but a tsunami that rushed across and broke the land. The, before that, the Black Sea was a freshwater lake, broke through, flooded it with seawater, and came in onto the shore. And those who were on the shore would have drowned. But those who managed to escape into the hills managed to wait a while. And that is where somebody told Césaire and her women, escape from here, get into your boats and go. And so she came to Ireland. But she must have been very important because she was a woman to start. And I'm afraid in ancient history, you will not find very many records of women doing clever things. Not until we got Mary Robinson in charge here. We didn't have anyone. But she came and she brought her body of women with her. I think she was probably a druidess or a seer one of the very important groups of women that were in the Middle East at the time, probably in Turkey. She might have been Egyptian. She would well have been Egyptian because they used sails on their boats, and the Egyptians were using sails on their boats long before anyone else. And they sailed up to Ireland, and they brought an army of men to protect them. That means she wasn't exactly one of the backstreet girls. She must have been someone very important to have this, to have this cohort of men protecting them. And they came first to Ireland. And she had, I think... 50 women when she landed, because their boats, of oh, course, wow. were wrecked on the way and they barely arrived and they came into Kerry and landed there. And they had 50 women and three men. I think that was it. Mm -hmm. Something like that. I have yeah. to check the book to see. <laughs> and uh, so she was very practical. She thought, OK, we've got to survive here. So she divided up the men, took the best looking of them for herself, Finton, 
and divide, give the other two, okay, you two have 25 women each, and uh, go forth and multiply. And uh, after a shortish time, these unfortunate or fortunate men, depending on what you call it, <laughs> they um, died. Uh -huh. And so Finton, she turned to him and said, okay, you're in charge of everybody from now on. Make sure we have enough kids coming along in the future. Don't ask me about uh, inbreeding. I don't mm, know. Yes. <laughs> but apparently uh, he couldn't stand it. The, the legend says that he couldn't stand it and he ran away. And he ran and hid in a cave. And she died of a broken heart and her women died also. The truth is that they died out. I don't know what. Probably not of a broken heart. Women don't usually. They get fed up, but they don't die of a broken heart. But they died. It may be, as we'll find in later people, that they died mm -hmm. of one of these strange epidemics in Ireland mm -hmm. they call the Yellow Plague. Okay. And, and but, but what's surprising, I suppose, then, about the, the following waves of people, they're not coming from Britain or no. North France. They're coming from Asia Way down, and I know. North Africa. And this is the marvellous thing, because to, maybe some of us grew up today thinking, oh, well, we're next to England and maybe next to France, and we probably did have a bit to do with Spain, but that's us out here on the edge. The heck we were. People were travelling to Ireland. People from, knew about us, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was people were coming to Ireland from Turkey, from Greece, from, far, from even, I think, from parts of the Russias, from Scythia, and on, from, there, from, from millennia. People have been coming here to Ireland to trade with us for a very, very long time. Only they're still doing it. But then they would, on the beach, undid their corded bales. They would mm -hmm. come to the shore and we'd come creeping out of the trees and they would undo what they had, what they'd brought, wines and spices and unusual things from the south, maybe fruits. And we would bring them down our hides and skins and our butter and fresh meat, all the things that Ireland could easily supply. And they would say, oh, we'll have some of those. And copper as well, which we mined here. And so we've had trade going for thousands of years. We're still doing it with containers instead of cord and bales coming. But back then, the people have been coming for a very long time. They used to come for the axes that were made off Rathlin Island. We had a very mm -hmm. hard stone there, which okay. made stone axes, and people would come for those. They'd come for the copper, they'd come for our fresh foods, which we all supplied. It was uh, We've had a trade for a very long time, mm -hmm. and that brought cultures with it, and it brought and, stories with it. And in it. the stories, there, like, there's, there's a lot of Greek influence, there's yep. a lot of... Oh yes, the know, golden apples, the, the Hesperides yes, the come into a lot Fomorians, of our legends. And would you maybe say a bit about the... The Fomorians, about the oh, the weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> oh, they were awful. <laughs> We've always had people coming into Ireland and either fight with or agree with the people who are there already. Look, we like your lands. Anyone would like it, it's green <laughs> and fertile. Yeah. I mean, if you've ever gone through... Even the Midlands of Spain, in midsummer, you'd be scared, or indeed the outback of Australia, when you see how desirable Ireland must have been, green and fertile and plenty of rain, so there was no problem with growing crops. You could stick a stick in the ground and it would grow. I've done it and it does. Mm -hmm. But you had the f people were always coming here and trying to take over, and the Fomorians were the baddies. Now, we know about the Vikings later on. They weren't so bad, honestly. <laughs> They weren't oh, so yeah, bad, the Fomorians were. They were these very strange creatures of legend. They're supposed to have been grotesque, very dark, and some people said they had only one eye in the middle of their forehead and only one leg, but I think one leg isn't practical. I mean, how would they get anywhere? <laughs> but they used to swoop on Ireland all the time and demand slaves. They used to take children. They probably wanted to practice. They probably didn't have many of their own. They needed to supplement their own tribes. They would take all the food that people had on the coast and take it away with them. They were terrible, and they had a weapon of mass destruction, which was Baylor of the Evil Eye. Now, Baylor of the Evil Eye would terrify anybody, and some parts of the country up around Sligo and up around the north, they still terrify children, Baylor of the Evil Eye. He was a horrifying little monster with one eye in the middle of his forehead, which they used to keep covered with seven layers of leather, some say, and some say it took ten men to lift the layers of leather for it. And anyone that I was faced on died instantly. Now, if you know your Greek legends, you'll have heard something else about this. Medusa, mm -hmm. Medusa, who the snaky locks who looked at people and she, they died. Or the Cyclops with one eye in the middle of his forehead. And that's where you get the fascinating stories coming from Greece. Whether our sailors were going down there, or whether there were sailors coming to our shores and said, here's a good one you won't have heard before. Did you ever hear a Medusa or something? But Baylor the Evil Eye had this power, and he was blooming, terrifying. 
and he would come on shore and they'd bring him in. They had to lead him because he was blinded because they were covering the eye. And then they'd open it and the troops would just fall dead in front of him. And uh, this was quite a powerful weapon to use in the days before we had guns. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about him was a bit of geographical truth that you get. You get a legend. Go out and look at the countryside and see why. The story has always been that he, he lived on Tory Island and came ashore to attack people. Tory has always said that it was where Baylor the Evil Eye lived because it's called Tory. And the story is that he lived on Tor Inish. Mm -hmm. So then I went searching in old documents and I found a, a very learned document hidden in a library uh, written in the 1930s by an academic. A very boring article, but he said, I don't think it was there because the old legend says that the, I think it's the two of the Donan or the, somebody was attacking the Fomorians to drive them out and they fought them by land and by sea. They came to him over the land and they came to him from the other side by the sea and they attacked him. And then afterwards they were fighting him on the sand and the tide came in. They were fighting so busily that the tide came in and they were all drowned. And I thought, well, Tory Island is a good nine miles, mm -hmm. 15 kilometers off the coast of Ireland. How the heck could they approach over the land? And how could they all be drowned on the sand in between? And this guy in the 1930s said, I think it's Derinish Island off the coast of Sligo. Now, I don't know how your Irish is, but if you were saying Derinish, if you were saying, I'm going to Torinish, to I'm a Dolgat Derinish. So Derinish is more likely to be the place. And I was writing this during the lockdown, and I was going on his documents, and I was going on Google Earth, and Richard was going through Google Earth like madly trying to say, I wonder, I wonder. Well, and finally, yeah. when the lockdown ended, we zoomed off to Sligo <laughs> and went along to the coast and saw Derinish Island and it looked just, it was close enough to the shore and as we were there the tide dropped and it was one of the best moments of my life, the tide dropped showing a sandbank leading to the shore and out quietly from the sand dunes came a procession of cattle and they quietly crossed to the island as they've been doing every day of their lives when the tide arrived. I, I nearly cried. Sure I think we should quick photograph it. We got the photograph into the book, but because I'd already done the text, I hadn't time to explain how thrilling okay. that was. Yeah. Geography proved that the old legends were true, that people still cross to the island and can cross a dry land. And if you don't watch it going back, you will get drowned going back over the sand. So trust in your legends if you read a legend. There is something underneath that's true. So, Tory, I'm afraid you've lost Baylor the Evil Eye. Mm -hmm. It definitely is Derinish off the coast of Sligo. And the, and the speed of the tide as well. The speed of the tide, it comes in very yeah. fast, like a horse galloping, yeah. yes. Like yeah. it does at so many other places yeah. where the sands are flat. Yeah. I suppose the one thing, the, the sense I got from, you know, almost throughout the book, that anyone getting on a boat and arriving on the coast is, is bad news. And I suppose, like I have, I grew up at least with, you know, we, we are the Celts and we're, they're the good guys, they're us. <laughs> and then the Viking came and they're the bad guys. But anyone kind of arriving on a boat probably had you peered out intentions, you know, and probably were arriving with weapons in preparation. Yes. And have you never, if you've been out to the shore, have you never, if you've been near trees, peered out instinctively rather than just going out <laughs> into the open? People do still. You, you have a look to see who's out there. Can you imagine back in ancient times, you come to the edge and say, there's a sail approaching. Who's that? Now, is it someone bringing wonderful goods from the South Seas, or is it another nasty mm -hmm. raider? Yep, the Celts were, um, were rather nasty warriors, mm -hmm. actually. You remember them. They came to the shore, they drove inland, and went to the Tua de Danann, who were the magical people who ruled Ireland at the time, who were probably early Vikings, who were tall and blonde and loved music. And they went to them and said, right, we're taking over now. And the Tua de Danann said, nope. You have broken the rules of war. You did not give us fair, fair notice. Go back out beyond the ninth wave and then try again. And the ninth wave is a magical thing on the Irish coast. If you're out beyond the ninth wave, you're, I think they mean beyond the pull of the tide, beyond where anyone can, uh, where we'll actually be brought to shore automatically. Because when they were punished people in the old days, they were sent out in a boat without oars beyond the ninth wave and then let the sea decide what to do with them. The old Irish tended not to kill people for punishment. That came with the English later on. They tended to put them out where the justice and the gods could decide what to do with them. But then they went back and they, they and the two they done and put a mist over the sea mm. so they couldn't get back in. But the Celts had their own gods, hadn't they? Their own druids. And they had a druid on board. And he went up to the top of the mast and said, right, it doesn't reach him up here. It's a magic mist. And he chanted one of his old charms on him as well. 
on the sea, on the sea, and the, the mist fell, and on they went and took the two of it on, and as we know, the two of it on and never left. They went into the earth, and they're still here in Ireland today. They're underneath the earth, and sometimes they come out because they love Ireland still. The Celts are right. Celts are much more warlike and bullying. Mm -hmm. Well, they are. Yeah, no. <laughs> and the two of them come it, out yeah. at times like Samhain and Beltane at Halloween and in May time. And they come out and they meet with the people and occasionally get to know them rather well, which is why you get the occasional beautiful child born who is half fairy and half human. Okay. Or all on great heroes. Is that a changeling or is that something else? Hmm? A changeling is something else. Oh, changeling is when the fairies is, is put in, is yeah. put in just for mischief. They take okay. away, if you've got a very beautiful child at I home, do? the fairies, <laughs> yeah, the fairies might take away, they might be jealous of your little daughter okay. and take her away because they think, oh, she'll be good in our place, she'll give lovely, she'll be lovely. <laughs> and they put a little fairy in your place and usually yes. the child tends to be wizened and red haired and very mischievous, mm -hmm. leaps out of a cradle in the middle of the night and wrecks the house like a poltergeist. Right. You probably feel you've got both of them on <laughs> And uh, yeah. yeah, no, that was a changeling. They do it or a okay. mischief. But no, they would occasionally breed with um, a, a young man or a young woman of the lands. So you'd get the healthy stock of the Irish. So the two of they down and then are the the, the origin folk. story, if you like, of the, of the fairy folk. Yep. Yeah. And they're still living under the hills, and they mm -hmm. come out. The near for the golden hair came out of the lakes of Killarney and took away um, O'Sheen, the son of Finn McCool, and she took him away mm. for what turned out to be a couple of hundred years, so he thought it was only yesterday, and he wanted to go home, he was lonely. And when he went back, of course, he found everyone had uh, forgotten everyone him. Had it was died. Hundreds of years people before. Died. Yeah. You can go with the fairy folk to Tiernanog, but you usually can't come back. Or if you do go to Tiernanog, you must never eat or drink anything they offer you, <coughs> no matter how wonderful it is. Or you'll be stuck there. Or you'll be stuck there forever. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good advice. Um, and the, so just, just to move on then, I suppose we come to the Vikings and the Celts were, were worse than we thought. They were. Or worse than we were, were taught at school. Were if you like. to believe, yeah. And then the Vikings, weren't, know, the Vikings were no a, worse than the rest, maybe. They were no Something worse like than the that. rest. We have a bad press on Vikings and I, I blame television for heaven's sake. <laughs> I mean, everyone watches it and I have a couple of people who took part in it because they had nice males who had nice long hair and could mm. look tough. And they always show them as brutal, and I find the series quite hard to watch, actually, because they emphasise the brutality of them. These were practical farming folk up in the Scandinavia, and when you get an awful lot of younger sons in a healthy community and there's no land for them, they tend to go out looking for it. So they used to go out ravaging and pillaging and grabbing stuff. I mean, if you know that there's an island down along there, and you're an expert sea man, because they were all very, very good at boating, you have to be in Norway where all you have all those fjords, you have to be good at boats. And it, they would come down and they'd snatch food and bring it back and say, right, that's just okay for the winter. And they would occasionally take steel people as slaves. Mm -hmm. There are two things here. One is that the, all the accounts we have of the Vikings were written by monks. They were the only ones really who were writing at the time. They were lettered and they would write things down. And naturally, they gave you a very prejudiced view of them. They would say, our, our place was ravaged last night. It was flattened not stone, left in a stone, every monk slaughtered. But I started looking further, and I found that there were other accounts written by someone who lived down the road. And they would say, oh, there was an attack on the monastery last night, and they took away all the silver from the church. And they took some monks as well as slaves. But the people went out next day, and they built it up again, and they, everything's OK mm -hmm. again. There were two ways of looking at everything. You know, if you have a row with someone and they say, oh, she said that, she said that, she said that, and then the other side of the story is completely different. Well, I think there are two ways of looking at the Vikings. Mm -hmm. They certainly did come ravaging and raging and pillaging because they I needed I suppose it's just our, our first historians, if you like, yep. were history, ones writing yeah. history. History is created by the people who oh. write the books. Mm -hmm. And that's something you always want to remember. Somebody's writing from their point and, of view. So if we that get, would have been the monks and the. It was the monks. Yeah. yeah. And you, it, this is a great fact, actually, that you, the, the monks of Clan McNoise recorded <laughs> 80 different invasions <laughs> yes. over the course of their history, but only seven. Seven were, were by the Vikings. Vikings. 80. This was of Clan McNoise, which is a very wealthy monastery where the Shannon comes up and joins the Schlemoor that comes across the middle of Ireland, the old, the ancient road across the middle of Ireland. I wrote about that in another book. And. It's, uh, that was a very valuable place, and they had a lot of riches, because kings used to give them riches to, in the hope of getting a place in heaven. And they, they recorded, I think it's on their records when you go there, 80 invasions of it. And I thought, well, come on. I went and had a look. Seven of those were by the Vikings. 
Um, I think there were 10 by the Irish themselves, another 10 or so, I can't remember the exact figures, by the Irish joining with the Vikings, and 40 <coughs> by the English. Uh, it, you know, you need to think about mm -hmm. this. This truth is out there somewhere, but it's <laughs> not. It's not as it's always written in the books. It's so easy to say the Vikings did it. I mean, I saw it on television the other night. They were all through. They must have done it. Because they... Slavery. Yeah. They often took people as slaves in Ireland. But let's have a cotton pick and rest here a minute. Everyone was into slavery. How do you think St. Patrick got to Ireland, for heaven's sake? We were going across to Wales, snatching slaves and bringing them back. We were going over the coast of France where we could get anyone there. Anyone on the coastline was fair game for slavery. The Vikings set up the biggest slave market. I think the Irish and the Scottish one was the biggest, but the one in Dublin was the biggest. The one mm -hmm. here was the biggest slave market in Europe. And what era are we talking about for this? Uh, this would be about uh, 850, thereabouts, okay. to up to the year 1000, thereabouts. Okay. Until somewhere around, I'm trying to remember, it's around, I have to check the book to do it, but so 1100 that most of the European countries outlawed slavery or they thought they did, mm -hmm. but the, it stayed on in Ireland and Scotland the last. It was a pra it's a hideous thing to think of now, but they were doing it, and they were taking people out to the Middle East where there was a big price paid for fair-haired, fair-skinned people. They wanted people like is, that. Is there. this just on the coast? Is the coast a more dangerous place to yes, live then? Yes, the coast was a more dangerous place More to profitable, live. maybe. Well, probably people the come in. I mean, if you were a raider, the you dived are. in, grabbed what you could, and got off again quickly. Mm -hmm. You didn't spend a few days hanging around until the local troops came down and attacked you. You came in. Living on the coast was always dangerous. And so most of the forts and towers and castles are yes, or to are protect well built, you, are well built the coast, for that purpose. Yeah. And yeah. I remember, of course, even later when they outlawed slavery. Do I need to mention that the French and the Portuguese and the English were going over to the South West Africa? Yeah and bringing pe taking people to the New World to sell as slaves, and then bringing back the sugar to Liverpool or to wherever else was that. The slave trade went on with other peoples an awful lot longer. And then jumping forward then to the 1600s and the sack of Baltimore, it's a story I hadn't Baltimore. heard, maybe. And again, it, it kind of, it just tells you so much about the different connections between the Irish, the English. Yeah, the, the Sack of Baltimore is a very Barbers. interesting story. You might know of it. It was uh, when they, I've forgotten the date of the Sack of Baltimore, I should know, but never mind, the Sack of Baltimore was when they came in, the Barbary pirates came into Baltimore and down the southwest of Ireland and snatched all the people from the village of Baltimore and carried them off to a life of slavery in the Middle East and Turkey, which was terrifying. And why and how and why do they do this? And then you look into the story and you see that there is more behind mm -hmm. this. Baltimore had been owned by the O'Driscolls, Finino O'Driscoll and Eastwood. They ran that part of the coast of Ireland and took tolls from anyone who was there. And they belonged to it. But they were getting broke. And the English were keeping an eye on it because they thought they were trying to keep Ireland subdued all this time. They were always trying to keep Ireland subdued, which is why they held Cork and places like that. And in Baltimore, when an Englishman came along and said, you know, I could like to set up a nice little community there in West Cork. We could catch fish, particularly pilchards, and we could uh, keep the place quiet for you and controlled, bring in English people, settle it, like the plantation of Ulster, mm -hmm. which has worked to this day, as we know, or the plantation of West Cork, which didn't work because the people who came there turned into the Irish and thought it was much more fun and didn't want to go back to England. But they moved into Baltimore and the English crown approved. Yes, you go there, you control the locals and make a fishing industry. And they were the ones there. They cleared out the local people and it was all English settlers in Baltimore. So when the Barbary pirates came sweeping in, they took English settlers. They cleared out all the English settlers out of Baltimore and took them off to Turkey. And that's not an accident. Mm -hmm. And so you look into it and you find that they had a, there was an agreement between Finino Driscoll, who was the rightful, if you like, owner of the lands, and Crook, Thomas Crook, and Walter Coppinger, who were a couple of scrounging men willing to get their hands on everything there, a 21-year lease of the lands so that they could work it and then he wanted it back afterwards and they had no intention to give it back afterwards. Mm -hmm. But that, that uh, raid took place exactly 20, 21 years to the day after the lease had been signed. So it's hardly an accident that these Barbary pirates came to this one little hamlet in this one little part of Cork 
and swept away all on the, on the English precise settlers. Day, yeah. But it also tells you they knew the coast. They'd never done one before, and they never did one again. They never came to Ireland to do that. They knew Ireland. They had friends. They probably had extra wives living in the villages along the coast. They were always coming over to Ireland so for a drink was, with the there locals. Was a, there was a local hand involved in, you know, like, in, I think in so. organizing this raid. There must have been. There must or, have yeah. been. Yeah. Someone told them exactly where to come and on the night to do it when they knew that the boats, the, the English fleet, which was up the coast further mm -hmm. up, wouldn't be available to come down to rescue anybody mm -hmm. there. So I think it was a local hand and I think probably the O'Driscolls planned it. Mm -hmm. We always were good at coming round from the back with the, the smiler with the knife under the cloak <laughs> and to get our own back and to say it is our own. It's a fascinating one that because it shows we had a very good link with the Barbary pirates and they were coming in all the time. It's a bit like the old one of the why do the Romans never invade Ireland? They didn't need to. Even back in the days of Tacitus, back in the year Dot, he had Irish princes in his entourage and they used to tell him where to go around the English coast, where to call in, that would be a good place to get yeah. something. They, they could get food and water and supplies in Ireland. They didn't need to invade a friendly country, but England was one that fought them. So they used to invade England, try okay. and control it. It's, uh, so it was the same with the Barbary pirates. They didn't need to invade Ireland. They never did, except for this one strange occasion when they cleared out the little village of Baltimore mm -hmm. of all of its uh, settlers and left it open for the Irish to come back in. And I suppose from around that, from around the kind of British plantation of Ireland, the culture and trade and sociology of the coast and of Ireland generally is so heavily influenced by the British and even the, the, the sort of businesses that, that arise, the kind of um, the fishing industry but also the seaweed industry for oil is sort of, you know, to, to feed the colonizer essentially. Um, and the taxes yes. that are imposed on the oh, trade yes. the sort of lead to heavily. all sorts of side industries and, and <laughs> I suppose, and, and, and continue trade with Spain and France and... Um, I see England's point of view, you know. I do see why England invaded us and held on to us for so long. I do understand it. They had to. They were petrified of France and Spain. Ireland, France and Spain, which were all Catholic countries mm -hmm. and fairly powerful. The other two were fairly powerful countries. And if England had let go for one second, they'd have been in here, and our future would have been quite different. But they would have taken over England, and England would have been the little sub-country that would have been ruled from the others. They couldn't afford to let go of Ireland. I do see that from their point of view. I don't like it, but I do see that's why they did it. And the, uh, where were we? The, uh, oh, the taxes. Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah, the excise. Well, it was pretty frustrating. Ireland has always been great for producing foodstuffs. And sheep's wool, for heaven's sake, I'm mad about spinning and sheep's wool myself. And we had a huge amount of wool which we would export to Flanders and to France and to the Italy, to the weaving industries. And the English taxed it. They had their own wool. As you know, you may or may not know, the Lord Chancellor in England, in the House of Lords, sits on a wool sack to show that this is where their riches come from. England made its wealth on its wool, and they were not going to have Irish wool cutting their market. So own Irish wool could only be exported through England, and at an extra cost. So really, if you sent your wool out to England, you might as well just leave it on the sheep or leave it at home and use it for insulating your house. You didn't make any money out of it. So something that had been our way of making an income for generations, for centuries, mm -hmm. for millennia, now it couldn't be done anymore because it had to be done through England, which in effect meant that you didn't get anything out of it. So naturally, we'd sent it out ourselves. We smuggled it out. And we smuggled out our other goods as well. Any other goods that were supposed to go through England. And what what are we talking about? What were we, what were we good at producing and trading? What were other countries interested in, in <coughs> Can one mention that? illegal liquor of course, on this programme? Yeah, yeah. uh, well, Pochine, of course. Hooch. Moonshine, or what's they call it in America? Uh, white, white lightning, they call it wow. out there when they do it. Which, you want me to get on to Inish Trahal and how they all had a wonderful yes, way of living? Us, yeah, tell us about them. <laughs> we had a, there's a place up in Ishoan Peninsula, up off Donegal, and Inish Trahal Island. They had an enormously good way of living in the 19th century, at a time when most places on the coast were starving and people were barely making enough to live on. Up there, they were all doing awfully well, and the population was growing. there was a population growing. boom. Yes, yeah, so there was a population boom. And they were asking questions in Parliament about this. How come they're so well off up there? And I said, well, I suppose it's the fishing. Uh, yes. What they were fishing for might have been... Uh, see, up off there and up off the north coast, you get all the boats coming from America, all the great ships going across to England, bringing their, all the containers of food, 
and groceries and everything else to England and cotton and business and brandy going back and forth, all the back and forth trade across the top of Ireland. Now, if a, a great ship passing the top of Ireland happened to drop a barrel quietly overboard at night, which a little tag on it saying, Ooh, I'm here, and it was only a couple of half a mile off the island of Inish Trahal, out would go the boat, tow it in to Inish Trahal, and hide it in the roof or in the loft or down below, and then take it down quietly the next day down into Derry and Loch Foil and send it on out from there. So stuff coming in, anything coming in, the, co the cotton from the south, mm -hmm. Southern States of America, sugar, any of the things that were of value coming from America that were des destined for the English market. This is going off. And uh, so going just out also, the, po the Pochine. Yeah. Yes, the Pochine. It's a very good place, the Inishowan Peninsula, because it's deserted and wild and heather-ridden, ideal for making Pochine. And they made very, very good poutine there. It put several of the local genuine distillers down in Derry and places out okay. of business because it was so good. It was much in demand in Ireland. It was much in demand in England. It was much in demand in America. So they would send it out, up in another barrel, up to where the boat was going back over to America. It would be picked up, taken on board, tucked underneath. Mm -hmm. And then they'd go on over to America with it. So it had a great industry going on it, both coming into Ireland and going out of Ireland. They had... Uh, I never tried any of that poutine. I love to know what it was I've like. I've had some from West Cork, actually, <laughs> recently, which is You have to make sure stuff. there's no, no drops in the bottom. If it's got a dead stuff left in the bottom, Sediment, you have to be very careful. Yeah. Strain it first before okay. you... Know. But it's supposed to be the only world's cure for flu. And I often <laughs> wondered, would it, would it cure COVID? <laughs> a hot poutine toddy. Tell but, of course, smuggling was down in the south as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, and it seems like the landscape is important, that the, the oh, coves and the creeks and the... You know the coast of, of Ireland. Hidden. If you go around where main road, you just go inland and go straight. But if you ever try to go around the coast, it would take you about 10 years to get around all the inlets. And uh, wherever you had a lot of inlets and secret caves and secret hidden places that you would not know about unless you knew the area very well. If you were a coast guard going past on your boat, you'd say, countryside, countryside, damn people, where can I get a coffee? And uh, you wouldn't notice it, but if you had somewhere like Kerry, where you have mm -hmm. a lot of deep inlets and caves, you could be hidden in there and they wouldn't find you on a month of Sundays. And of course, there were the big families. Well, yeah, one of the, but the perfect spots is around Derry Nan. Derry Nan and Daniel O'Connell, the liberator, and his family. Now, they, he was a tough man, Daniel O'Connell, and you had to be. You couldn't take on the English and you couldn't get ma Catholic emancipation unless you were extremely tough. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a gentle soul at all. But his family had been in this business for an awfully long time, uh, smuggling, or as they would call it, free trading. Now, I'm sure you've gone over to somewhere in the days when it was stricter rules and brought back something you weren't supposed to bring back. I remember a time when there were strict rules on how much uh, brandy you could bring into Ireland or how much wine you could bring back from a trip to France before we joined the EU. And of course you brought it back and put it under the boot of the car or something like that and didn't say anything. Well, it was more like that with the, the O'Connells and lots of the other families mm -hmm. along. The, they thought, why the heck should I be paying English taxes? This is my country. France is another country over there. I'm on good terms with them. I have friends over there. I am darned if I am, they said probably something stronger than darned, if I'm going to pay taxes on this. And I have friends who will pay me to have this brought in. Velvets, silks. Beautiful dyes, beautiful spices, wonderful things for your food, and brandy, and wine, of course. You had it brought in by boat, quietly, on a moonless night. You did not need a good moon. You wanted it a dark night. And you brought it in. And the O'Connells did a lot of this. They did it both ways. Not only did they bring in all this, and they had claret for themselves. Because a lot of them had had a French education, and they liked drinking claret for their meals, so all this came in. And they brought in Venetian glass and a whole lot of other wonderful things. And out went the wool, the flannel, the linen, the cotton, the, not the cotton, that came in, the linen, and people. Because young Irish men hadn't a hope of getting a good education back in the days before emancipation. They could only get it by vowing to, to follow the English crown and the English sword and taking the English oath. That was the only way they could get to a, a good school or get good education. So what they did was go to France and join the Irish Brigade or get an education in a French college. And they were called the wild geese for that. The first wild geese were the ones who went away after the Battle of Kinsale, the, the, no, the nobility of Ireland. But the young men, for long after that, were also called the wild geese. Hmm. They would get on a boat. They would be hanged if they were caught. The English would not allow them to go somewhere else and fight under another flag. They were considered to be 
lesser citizens of England, but they would go down there and they'd be taken on board a boat secretly and taken over to France. I was mentioning this to somebody in a pharmacy the other day in West Cork, I was chatting to him, and he said, oh yeah, my family used to have a boat down off uh, Galley Head, and uh, you'd often get the young men coming from somewhere else quietly by boat, and they'd get onto the big one and be taken across. I thought, your family did that, why didn't you tell me before? <laughs> They would go across to France and they'd get an education there or they would join the, the French Brigade, the Irish Brigade in France and they would learn their skills and they would learn to train to fight, to fight so that in the end they hoped they could get the English out of Ireland. It was a, a marvellous thing. I wonder if the young Daniel O'Connell ever went down there I remember, yeah. and helped you know, bring barrels up from the shore and up into the caves. And he drank the claret, I'm sure, but yeah, <laughs> you imagine he'd been, he'd been involved. I imagine he was. Yeah. I imagine he was. Hold, oh, do you know, they didn't see it as wrong, for heaven's sake. They saw it as taking what was rightfully theirs, trading decently with another country and yeah. paying the right amount for it, not going through I, so, England. I learned a fact during the week, and it's from a very superior, illustrious source, the Harry Bikers. Um, I don't know if you watch it, but they were, they were traveling around the UK and talking about seafood and the, the fishing industry and one of the facts was, one of the stats if you like, was that 70% of the seafood that British people eat um, comes from abroad, is traded in and 80% of the seafood they catch around the coast of England is traded internationally. So there's this, I suppose everyone's eating and catching but not really their own stuff but not or their, their own, own goods. This is and, I, and I yeah. kind of thought it was a, you know, alarming in, in terms of it is unnecessary international toing and froing. Of, Mind you, we can't but, talk. How many, when's must, the last time exactly, any of you ate an yeah. Irish apple? No, you buy them from a supermarket and they've come from Chile or they come from South, they've come from heaven knows where. We or, or an abalone, like one of our kind of richest. One of our richest fruits, yeah. and then we have in Spain, and yet we have orchards here in Ireland where the apples are dropping on the ground mm. and not picked. I think that's immoral. England stopped feeding itself about the end of the 18th century, mm -hmm. when the Industrial Revolution really got going and everyone went into the cities, to the factories. England hasn't been able to feed itself since then. I was kind of entertained when it was suggested at the worst part of Brexit that uh, the English, someone in England, I think it was Farage, said, we'll starve Ireland out. And I thought, uh, bit difficult, that sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> we've always been able to feed ourselves, so we're a bit casual about it. Now, we've always been able to feed other countries too, which is why we've been so valuable. We've, been, uh, we've always had plenty of food, but England hasn't been able to feed yeah, itself. I remember long hearing a stat a number of years ago that Ireland could feed 36 million people from yeah. the food it produces, but we're just so underpopulated that, and I, in, in terms of like British, that, that British strat, stat statistic as a comparison, it feels like we trade out but probably don't take as much in, in terms of food at least. But, e but even at that time, it was just surprising to learn how much we were trading and the scale of the fishing industry and where the fish were ending up as well. Yes. Uh, it really was, and of course, throughout history, kind of an international... And of course and the throwing. fishing industry out of Waterford and Wexford too. The, uh, remember, they used to join, the young men down there used to join the fishing boats going north to Newfoundland mm -hmm. and Greenland, the fishing and the whale fishing industries. They'd go down there. They'd, some of them would never even have seen the sea before. They'd come down one of the sister rivers, the Barrow, the Nora Shore, and they'd join up with one of the boats coming across, usually from England, but sometimes from Spain or France, that was going up to the Greenland fisheries. And they'd join it and they'd go up there for the year. And what they must have seen up there. And the lives they led up there, and then they'd come back home, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Some of them stayed on there. I've seen graveyards up there with all the Irish oh, names and yeah. the, yeah. Yeah. the Newfoundland. And then I suppose one more way of making making a money or I suppose it would almost be like a Christmas bonus would be shipwrecks oh, you know, that yes. come in they're ra shipwrecked. rare enough but we've had as you know we've had enough our shipwrecks the number of them around the coast you get occasionally other places saying oh we've had lots of shipwrecks well the Irish coast is particularly dangerous and that it's tricky but, and, and and it's a place where people stop before they move on it's yeah. kind of the last port of call it is the last port of call Crookhaven and down in West Cork is was the last place traditionally for anyone going to the new world they'd call in there for fresh water and it was also the first place people would come coming across from the new world and quite often they'd be desperate for fresh water or food and they'd call it there. it was a real time now we're, we're used to having plenty on board for all the time we need but then it mm -hmm. would these Ireland was a first port and a last port of call for anybody and we always had food for them and so there'd be full ships 
arriving and that might get wrecked. And the treatment with which, I, you tell a few different stories I did, the book. I did. The treatment with which the captain and crew are met is mixed. Sometimes it's mixed. You've got something like the city of Chicago, which went ashore off the, uh, the old head of Kinsale, mm -hmm. and it rammed in right under the old head of Kinsale. That was in the 1890s. And the people were rescued terrifyingly. The, cliff, the old head of Kinsale has, is a hell of a place with really deep cliffs. And they were hundreds of feet below, and they were on a shelf of rock because the tide was out. And once the tide came in, they were dead. Hundreds of people, women, children, babies, everything. And the people from the, all around the Hamlet Sorum came rushing to the cliff edge, put ropes over, people abseiled down to a halfway point, and with great courage managed to pull people up to that level. And then the Coast Guard managed to come along later to try and get them onto boats. But it was, they rescued those people, including a terrifying story of getting a woman climbing up a rope ladder and her baby in her arms, and the baby fell from her arms. <sighs> I want to think of it. Mm. You, cannot, you know, anyone who has children just gets shaken at it, but a man below reached up and caught the baby and he shouted to her, it's all right, you know. And he climbed up after her and she was safe. And the baby was safe. And the people came out from their cottages on the hillside and brought them into their cottages and gave them food. The people there would have had very little food of their own, but they gave them hot drinks, they gave them what food they had, and they looked after them. There was one very annoyed Englishman, I remember, on board, and he said, I was charged. They asked for money <laughs> for the food they get. Did he not realise that that was all they had in the house? And things like that. Now, they were looked after them, and they were kind, and they were careful, they gave them what they had. They were not always the cases. It depends where you landed. There were a couple of cases of boats being wrecked on the coast down in Kerry, or mm. anywhere around the coast, really. And the local people who'd been watching it coming in were ravening get at it, and as soon as it crashed on the shore, they were on it, pulling it apart, wrecking it, despoiling it, even taking things from the people who managed to get ashore, taking things from them. We were not wreckers in Ireland. I know you read romantic stories in Daphne du Maurier and others about the uh, Jamaica Inn and the wreckers. There's no evidence at all that we ever tried to guide ships onto the shore in Ireland. I've never found any. But what we did do, if the ship got wrecked on the shore and its tides its sides were blown open and things spilled out on the shore. The local people descended on it like locusts and took it away. And you can't blame them. You had two groups in Ireland. You had the well-to-do, who were mostly those who had sworn allegiance to the English crown and who had jobs and living. If you're not hungry and if you have a home to go to, it's very different to being someone who's living hand to mouth and who sees food spilt on the shore. You go and you grab it. If you've ever been hungry somewhere and you know that you come across somewhere where there is food, you know how you grab it and hide it. Well, that's what the Irish did. They went down and they took for things from these boats. And the customs men would come along and fire on them and order a, 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 order, offer a pardon, I think, to anyone who informed on his neighbours. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I don't think anyone took Unlikely. it up. Yeah. It wasn't a good idea to be an informer in those days. But they did. They, people could. It depends on your luck. If you were yeah. shipwrecked on a very poor part of the coast, and possibly depending on that, the period in history yeah. and how the people were faring. At I mean, that during time the famine, the those coast. people were dying of hunger, and there were ships still being sent out to England and to other countries with grain on board and food. And if one of those got wrecked on its way out, well, what would you mm -hmm. have done if you'd been living around those villages and you were dying and your children were dying? You'd, uh, you'd go and probably take the stuff out of it as well. And that notion of famine food that you mentioned, that seafood, certain seafoods or... Um, For a long time afterwards, yeah, right up into my childhood, people wouldn't touch the food. It's like walking on hungry grass. They say that the parts of Ireland where if you walk around and you suddenly feel a starvation coming on you, it's because you've been walking on hungry grass where people have died of the famine. But I remember when I was a child, there were people who wouldn't touch seafood. They said it was famine food. And maybe, like I suppose the book goes, the book covers a huge amount of ground historically and it comes right up to very close to the present where it comes talking about Tom Crean and, oh, yeah. um, and the communications. And Marconi and communications and Oh, that's uh, lovely, Reuters the, the Reuters, Reuters that story, sort of yes. Yeah, yeah. Reuters but, and, but, and Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just wondering, just going back to the kind of the attitude to seafood, but also to the sea, and perhaps decline in like industries around here. We still mm. have a huge port industry, but the number of people working in it by comparison with even the 60s and 70s has gone into decline. Um, and I suppose the sense, you give a, a real sense that there was, the seas were really full, whereas 
nowadays it's the skies that are full with air yes. travel and that maybe there were fewer people relying on the sea for a living here and so we're, we're would you say that we're less connected or less aware or knowledgeable i think we went through a phase every child is ashamed of its parents at some stage <laughs> and yeah. i think we probably went through a phase where we didn't need the sea it's like you know, we did, we did, and we thought, well, now we're going to the skies, we don't need this. I think we've come round and we're doing it more from an appreciation point of view. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are now becoming more, because we don't have to hunt for food anymore and rely on the sea to get us places or to bring our food, we are looking at the sea differently and realising how much we owe to it, how much we should look after it. We're much more aware mm -hmm. of the pollution of out fishing and killing off fish altogether, yeah. of fish craft. We're aware of the need to look after the sea, I think. There is, yeah, it feels like there is a recent turn. And like you say, it's, it's less about living off the sea. It's more an aesthetic appreciation um, People are using of what it, the sea yeah, can give People us are using it more as a relaxation. As you know, you, wrote, you wrote a book about swimming once yeah. and swimming from different places and what yeah. swimming does for you. Yeah. And I would say also boating and canoeing and boarding, mm -hmm. all these things that you're seeing now being done, people are becoming aware of it as a therapy as well, as well as, and, and honouring it. I would hope that we would in future honour the sea as a mm -hmm. wonderful, beautiful place that shaped us, that made us what we are today, and that we now need to give back to. And I think going out onto the sea, whether beyond the ninth wave or not, recaptures that for us a bit. You get more of a, a richness from mm -hmm. it and realise that this is where we came from. Heaven knows we all probably have some DNA from Greece and Scythia and anywhere like that. And that it made us what we are today and has shaped Ireland. And that we now need to do more to look after it. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the, let's imagine someone writes this book 100 years from now. What will the last century look like? It will kind of certainly a kind of, you know, wind, we're looking at offshore wind farms and hopefully. We are. And uh, kind of. Um, wave energy and I suppose maybe more that like I, I noticed that the, the, there was a real pickup in sea swimming after the crash in yes. 2000 kind of 2008 9 10 and that was kind of in line with a boom in I'm not a triathlon or I don't know if that's what you call them yes but people doing triathlons and realize oh, I better can learn to swim now you know as well um, but it's redoubled since the pandemic, I feel. The pandemic has brought the same effect as 9-11 did as the crash we had in finances here, in that people go back to the things that matter. Mm -hmm. They go back to real things they can touch. As I said, things like spinning wool or swimming or making something with your hands or making your own food or even, God knows, grinding your own corn to make food as people would have done in times gone by. Mm -hmm. Going back to the things that matter. And I would hope that they will say in that chapter in a hundred years' time, that they will say that more people move to another way of thinking yes, and then begin to make yeah. much more awareness of what we have. Mm -hmm. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Uh, are there questions or comments from the room now? Is it like, come at you cold, a bit too cold there? Have a think, if you like, or maybe, yeah. yeah sure. <coughs> um, I guess you different around all the entire coast, but it's been, been good and bad, but I mean, ultimately the fact that Ireland, Ireland and Ireland nation has probably been to its benefit overall. Do you agree with that? I didn't quite get that with the mask on, I'm the afraid. Th the fact that Ireland was an island nation, would you say that has overall, despite good and bad, would, would you say it's been overall a benefit? To us oh, I think it's country. been a benefit for us. I think it's been a benefit for us and not being industrialised either. England did that on purpose, made sure that we weren't industrialised as much as there. But I think it also was a benefit to us because we were self-reliant and we always knew we could do things and survive on our own. We kept that a lot longer. We still have it in that we still feed ourselves. In that, yeah. I think, in a, in a very, very industrialised society somewhere, they've lost their touch. And of course, they've got a tunnel too going to France. Well, they have at the moment. And they, I think Ireland, it was a benefit to us. You know that old song, oh, the sea, oh, the sea, is Broghel McCree, long may it roll between England and me. <laughs> it's a sure guarantee. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
It's yeah. a, I think it was a great benefit that we're an island nation because we have always looked out, outward and seen what welcomed what came in sometimes, but gained so much from other countries our own, but were still separate and could develop. We have kept in Ireland our own culture, our own legends, our own stories. Do you know that in England, most parts of England have lost all of those. They had as many as we had once. And only now in parts of Cornwall and sometimes in parts of Scotland, you'll find some of the old legends and stories kept alive and maybe in Wales. But we've still got this huge culture and memory and folk memory and legends. And in England, they've lost all of that because they went for a practical living as part of a great nation, not a small island. Yes, I think being an island has been of great benefit to us. Any, thanks very much for the question. Yeah. Any, any other? Yeah, fire away. Yes, yes, the, the Celts had their own gods. They were much more warlike, their own legends and their own gods, as had the Norse and everyone else. The Celts had been travelling for a long time. They'd been come up from, I think, very far west and south. They, by the time they got to Spain, which is where we usually think of them, they'd been travelling for generations from the Middle East and across. They think the Celts came from India originally, very hard to tell, and spread their way across and they had their own gods. I can't remember the names of the moment of some of their gods, but I know that Amergin, who was on that first boat of the Celts that came to Ireland, he was one of their druids who could call on their ancient gods to bring down a more powerful force than the... Than the and would there be like specifically gods of the sea as well? Mananon MacLeod, no. Was he one of the... Um, was he one a Celt? I think he was, yes. I think Mananon Montlear was one of the, uh, the son of Lear. He was one of the Celtic sea gods. He ruled the sea. He was, of course, as you know, the spouse of the Cailach Bera, the Hag of Bera, who was the great crone of wisdom in Ireland, which is a, a marvellous blend of the Celtic and the Tuatha Dé Yep, he would have been in charge of everything that happened in the sea and rule over the people that went to sea. And he had a land underneath the sea as well. You get it in the old legends of Ireland, the old Imrama the old Celtic tales of travel yeah. of the ancient legends. St. Brendan never did. He never was. No? No, he was not. He was an invention by the Christians. They, we had Brendan, and we had Maeldoon, and we had Ma Bran MacFable, and they were all our old Irish legends. And when Christians came in on and started writing these down, they were the first people to write anything down, and the, the, uh, the old druids came along and told them the stories, and they said, oh, well, that one, yes, sounds a bit anti-Christian to me, <laughs> so they called it St. Brendan instead and said he went and did all these things. Well, he did not. Like many of the other stories, though, was it based, do you think, on, it based a, one of the on old a particular legends. journey? Okay, yeah, yeah I think couldn't... probably on the voyage of um, Maeldoon. Maeldoon went out and found magical whales, okay. and he went out and he found icebergs, and he uh -huh. went out and he visited Iceland, the land where they threw fiery rocks at him. So we do have kind of two, two versions, maybe, Two versions, of the story and the Nolan Christian and one. You, yeah. I would always mistrust the Christian one. I do not wish to really object to anyone's <laughs> beliefs on them, but the Christians had a job to do in Ireland. They had an agenda. They had an agenda, and the first one, I mean, look what they did to Bridget, for heaven's sake. <laughs> we had this wonderful goddess called Bridget. She was a powerful woman. She was in charge of everything that helped women and craft work and all sorts of and animals. And the Christians, when they came, didn't like that. So they changed her down. They made her change her down into a little, um, a little saint who plucked at God's robe and said, do you mind ever doing something to help people? Bridget wouldn't have done that. She was like the old school, like Grana Whale, the fiery queen. She would say, right, let's get this done. She was a powerful woman because in the ancient Ireland, women were far more powerful. Now, as you probably know, if you've read the Brehan Law book, women had far more rights than they do these days even. And she was that sort. And then they turned her into a little saint who was just there to, to entreat to a God, a Christian God. How they ever sold Christianity, I don't know. Because in Ireland, we believe that the gods, we're over our time, I better stop. We, no, they they believe okay that um, you had to placate the gods so you'd get a good crop, so you'd get good, healthy children, so that you'd have fine weather in the summer, so that things wouldn't be too bad. It was important to keep in with the gods, and so you prayed to them and you laid offerings to them so that you would. Have, it was practical. We were a countryside with crops and children and people, you needed fertility. And along come these people from the Middle East who say, OK, in the future, you're not going to believe in any of that. You're going to believe there is no reward here, but you've got to do good and give us money for the, next, for the rest of your life so that you'll go to an afterlife afterwards, which will be much better than this one. I don't know how they got that across, but people, they didn't, of course. 
You've only got to look at the statues now in Ireland around. You know, how many statues mm -hmm. do you see on the country? The grotto? That's Dana, Danu, the goddess of fertility, the mother goddess in Ireland. And the reason we have such a cult for the mother of Christ is that it was, it's really the old earth goddess. Okay. And we're still worshipping her. Yeah, I prefer to have multiple gods than, than one. Plenty to choose from. It's right from, under the know. surface. Reach down to the moss in any Irish place and right under the surface we're still pagan. We're still as yeah. pagan as anything. And it has still. lived alongside in a way. I mean, it has. And, and like they took the, the holy the well. They took the fairy wells. stories and yeah, yeah. The Between the fairy stories, stories and the holy wells and everything. They're all our old beliefs. Crow Patrick was there long before Christianity came. Any place you see so much that says that St. Patrick came here and overcame the dragon. That's a great sign, okay. because the dragon or the snake is the sign of the old religion. I see, okay. And anywhere you'll find him conquering a dragon, said, right, we got in there and we did it. I don't blame them, they were trying to make their mark. <laughs> to do that, then, But we yeah. should never forget our ancient ways. Original stories. The old ways in Ireland. Yeah. You shouldn't, have, they're how we are. In most countries we are, except it's gone too far, I think, in some countries like England, the industrialized countries. Down in America, some in the southern states down, in Louisiana and places, you'll still find very strange old traditions. And in some parts of Germany, you'll find the old traditions still. You should always hold on to those. Always hold on to them, because they're what we're made of. Okay, that brings us up to the air. I, I, you get a sense, yeah, I, you've just gotten a kind of a, um, yeah, a, a, a master class in storytelling. So that's... Ah. That's the, what they were. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't. They would. They had thrice times fifty stories in their heads. The old storytellers, yeah, yeah. but they all had truth in them. But yeah, thanks. Just to say thanks very much. It's an incredible book. You're an incredible storyteller, and thanks for <laughs> oh, delivering lovely. just some of some some of what's in the book. Um, so I obviously I, I've read it. I highly recommend it. It really thank is lovely. Thank you for being such a lovely interviewer. And, uh, it covers so much. It covers so much ground. There's, there's a huge amount of really entertaining stories packed in. Lots of lots of disaster, but that's that's drama. Drama, drama and good tragedy story. and disaster so there you go, too. Yeah. But some uh, lovely ones in there yeah, too. So so thank you and thank thanks Richard who uh, produced the photographs uh, in the book. Uh, have a look at. The, I believe they're for the over for sale over there. And thank you for coming down this far down the docks. And I it's lovely you, though. I it's always industrial history. Hour. It's a lovely yeah. place to be. Yeah. Okay. So thanks very much. And thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Thanks, guys. <laughs>